A theological reading of Genesis 1. Uh, this is, as we mentioned before, a um, part five of the book called In the Beginning. Uh, full title, In the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. And uh, it's edited by Brian Ball. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Brian Ball was born in Devon, England, got his MA in, from Andrews, PhD from the University of London, was a church pastor evangelist and was conference president of the North England Conference before being called to Australia to be principal of Avondale College, which is I think now Avondale Adventist University or something like that. He's now president of the South Pacific Division. He's married to Don, has three children. No word on grandchildren, but uh, that's what uh, uh, that's who he is. It was written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive. Its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins, and because of that, the book is largely about theology. It doesn't. Uh, it does some. It has some discussion of the scientific issues, but it's mostly looking at what the theology itself is. Um, he argues for evidence for faithful transmission of the text, uh, arguments against higher criticism. We're going to get into one of those uh, next week by uh, Brian Ball himself, actually. And um, for a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament, which, uh, um, and then he does uh, at the end include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Renville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson of the Geoscience Research Institute and uh, our own Ariel Roth, who used to be with Geoscience and is now retired, I guess. Uh, so now has time to do anything he wants to, uh, almost. <laughs> and it also finally deals with theistic evolution and uh, the attempt to create a morality uh, with evolution. Uh, our chapter today is um, written by a Lawrence Turner, for those of you who don't know, and I was one of them until I uh, looked it up on Google. Um, he has a BA from Newbold College, got his MDiv from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. I assume that's in Andrews, but I, it, doesn't, it didn't say in this specifically in the source I was able to find. Got his uh, uh, Master in Theology from Princeton. Theological Seminary. I got a PhD from the University of Sheffield and is currently a principal lecturer of Old Testament studies and director of research degrees at Newbold College. Somewhere in the middle of that he spent some time at Avondale College as well. Uh, his specialty is actually Genesis and he's written three books, one of them simply entitled Genesis and the, another one having to do with story. Um, uh, and he is married, and as of 2009, the blurb said that he had seven gen grandchildren. So that's, of course, subject to change. Uh, the, uh, he starts out his chapter by saying, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are the most intensively studied portion of the Old Testament. The scientific, and his, the scientific and historical aspects of the text still attract scholarly endeavor, but these days almost entirely from conservatives. Now, he's referring to uh, conservatives, uh, Adventists and non-Adventists. As he goes on to say, Adventist scholarship has a long history of such engagement, with a large proportion of its work being apologetic. The importance of the Sabbath for Adventist theology is one of the major motivations for such work. Unfortunately, the assumption that affirming a literal reading of the narrative establishes its theological truth has resulted in numerous works that deal in d detail with the former and largely neglect the latter. And no claim is made that the present chapter is a major contribution to redressing the balance, although to be fair, he has three books to his credit that do try to do just that. But the hope is that it will indicate the potential of a theological reading of these chapters. By theological reading, I have in mind not 
detailed doctrinal confessional formulations appropriate to the production of a creed, but rather a reading that foregrounds the inherent thrust of the text, what it states, explicitly or implicitly, about the nature of God, humans, the world, and matters of ultimate significance for the life of faith today. Now, forgive me for just pointing out that uh, I thought that was what a creed was supposed to do, is summarize what the Bible had to say. If you're making a creed that reflects the biblical uh, authority. <coughs> um, so I'm not sure why we're uh, uh, saying it's not a creed. Um, but uh, in any case, that's his, his vision. He points out that his, his comments are limited to Genesis 1, whereas in some of his books he comments on all the way from Genesis 1 to Genesis 49 and 50. Uh, so we're going to be looking primarily at the very first, uh, uh, when he says Genesis 1, he means Genesis 1 through Genesis 4a. And uh, we'll be discussing that particular part of it uh, next week. Um, uh, I said Genesis 1 through Genesis 2 4a. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is primeval history, with the rest of Genesis being what they, what they call ancestral history. That is, at first it's talking about all of humanity, and then the focus narrows down to Abraham and his descendants and his surroundings in uh, Genesis 12. Uh, he says that there is a biblical perspective that animates the entire bi biblical witness. So in, in this particular area, he's in full agreement with the person we talked about ye uh, last week. It, the, uh, the story in Genesis 1 appears to be simple stories for simple <laughs> readers, and I think he'd say that for all of Genesis. But he goes on to say, this seriously under underestimates the complexity of the Genesis story and the power of stories in general. And with this, I would concur. <coughs> in particular, we should remember that Hebrew authors, my misspelling, delighted in writing accounts that had a definite design, often using repeated, repeated patterns which underlined the significance of what they were writing. Um, and he's going to look at the text just uh, kind of an overview, and you'll notice that it starts out with chaos, tohu abohu, uh, and then goes for the creation of day and night, and uh, in day one, the sea and the sky in day two, although the sea is kind of, you get a little star because it looks like the sea was there at the beginning. Uh, water was on the face of the deep. Um, but certainly, th that's where the waters above the firmament were, whatever the firmament was, were separated from the waters below the firmament. And uh, the sky, the firmament itself, was created. And then in day three, you have land and vegetation. In day four, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars, which come out at night. Um, you have the f sea, which had produced the fish, and then the sky, which uh, uh, had birds flying in it. And then finally, in day six, you have animals and humans, although the parallel is not quite as precise as the other two in that uh, uh, both animals and humans live on land and eat vegetation, so it's not quite as uh, uh, perfect a parallel. But you can still see that there's a great deal of parallel, and certainly there are um, uh, as the story is being told, there are things that do fit in with the numbers, even if they don't fit in precisely with the relationships. And then finally, you get to day seven with rest and sanctification. There's actually a note on that as well, but uh, it's not as uh, informative. Uh, in C, he explains why he puts the C in day two. Uh, and he draws from this the standard theological lessons, for example, the horizontal and vertical 
correspondences which we've uh, referred to, and that implies a god of order. Uh, chaos is not a force actively opposed to God. Uh, the chaos is simply what God starts with and then uh, basically effortlessly uh, creates from uh, or organizes, if you please. Um, God did not create something substandard, although this is almost a throwaway line, and I wish he'd uh, um, done a little better job of explaining that. Um, human beings are not the climax of the account. Now, this is a little different from the usual uh, perspective, that the climax of the account, in fact, is the seven days. Creation was not limited to the production of physical objects. And that's a perspective that is sometimes missed. Um, now, he does say God is a God of order, and we kind of expected that. He finds uh, another order in the text uh, uh, that refers to each day as you go through it. There's an introduction and God said. Uh, and then there's let there be whatever it is, and it was so. And finally, the evaluation, and God saw that it was good. And then there's the time frame afterwards, the evening and the morning, the whatever it was day. So there's some organization in the text there, too. Um, one of the points that he makes is that God simply speaks, and it happens. He doesn't have to slay a dragon and split its... Uh, with great effort or avoid uh, uh, monsters that are coming at him, as we have seen before in the in the Maelish. Um, th another point that he makes is that not only is this record of regularity important, so that God is a God of order, but then whenever you don't find the regularity, that becomes an extremely salient point. And in the seventh day, you have precisely this kind of change. It's not balanced with another day. It's, you know, each of the first ones are, are in some kind of a grid that you can see. The seventh day is just kind of there. Um, there's no time frame. There's no evening and morning where the seventh day. And then there's something that happens to the seventh day that doesn't happen anywhere else. It is Kodesh, it is sanctified. None of the other days, not even humans, are sanctified. The seventh day is, in fact. So that the climax is this creation of a special time to memorialize the creation itself. Um, he gives a convenient summary of this particular part of his chapter, and I'll just read it. E even before the content of the creation count is investigated in any detail, the way in which it is structured indicates some important theological issues. The balance and symmetry of the account indicate that God is a God of order, who brings order out of chaos. He effortless, effortlessly creates every physical object. His creation is good. But the fact that the account climaxes with non-physical holy time rather than the creation of humans shows that God's work points beyond them. Now he discusses the relationship to the ancient Near Eastern thought. And he starts out by saying, all true theology aims to relate to the world in which it exists, in which it is always in dialogue. Um, yes, just one minute. Uh, I hate to interrupt you, but doesn't Christ though, clarify the point of the Sabbath? He said the Sabbath was actually made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So it seems almost like Christ points back to man as a climax and saying this was a special blessing made for them. Um, I think his answer to that would be that... Um, he is ex, uh, explicating uh, what the Genesis account actually says. Uh, it would be interesting to see him wrestle with your, uh, the point that you're making. And I think that 
uh, perhaps uh, if I were pushed to try to make some kind of an explanation myself, I would say probably the best way to, to deal with that from this point of view would be to say that the the Sabbath is actually made for us in a spiritual way. Uh, it is saying that we are more than the molecules that we're made of, that ideas, that mind, that, uh, that uh, um, things that can't be reduced to uh, the material are important. And the Sabbath ministers to us not, uh, the Sabbath is not primarily intended for rest. It is always uh, also intended for communication with God um, and for understanding God's plan for us and for this world. And that a reading that simply takes the physical and stops there is not a valid reading. And the Sabbath is intended precisely to help us understand that. Now, I don't know if you find that convincing or not, but I, I think that's probably the best way I could uh, explain it for him. It, it's too yeah, bad that I we mean, don't have him here and he can... Uh, it's almost though like he suggests that the whole purpose of creation was to highlight the Sabbath. I mean, uh, I have to I, say... I agree that the Sabbath points us to God and his creative power and, and his love for us and even his sacrifice for us in some ways. But uh, the, the Jews and the, and had elevated the Sabbath to prim, uh, predominance so much so that even the sufferings of man were in secondary consideration to obedience of the Sabbath laws. And Christ said, hey, when it comes to choosing between uh, human needs and observing the Sabbath, you, you uh, support human need. You can even break s Sabbath laws in order to support human need. Uh, according to Christ, and this is this kind of lowers the Sabbath in prominence in at least the Jewish eyes of the culture of the day significantly below the needs of man and the predominance of man and in some sense, Christ was a a humanist uh, and made things subservient to man, even the Sabbath, uh, not to lower the the fact that the Sabbath points to God or that God should be worshipped, but that that God actually made us to enjoy life and and the Sabbath was to be part of that. Um, I, I understand the point, although I'm, I'm, um, I, I think that may be misunderstanding what the Sabbath is on the part of the Jews of his day, rather than the actual, uh, an actual problem with the Sabbath. Yeah, certainly, Jesus would just try to clarify what the Sabbath was yeah. originally intended to be. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Jesus has a lot of uh, Old Testament background uh, backup for that position. In that, uh, you know, is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness and so forth? Uh, the 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 real Sabbath rest is connected with. Um, the uh, uh, not covering yourself from your own flesh, presumably not meaning your own person, but, but those who share flesh with you, those who share the, descended, the being descendants from Adam with you, that uh, the fast that you've chosen, and then it goes on to link the Sabbath with that particular uh, uh, a point. So um, I, I would be careful about saying that Jesus simply uh, turned the Sabbath into something that uh, during which you can do um, whatever good you see without regard for anything. Uh, uh, I mean, Jesus himself still uh, went to synagogue on Sabbath. Uh, the uh, I don't I don't think it's 
a bad idea for us, for example, to come to Sabbath school here on Sabbath. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, most of us would probably violate Jewish halakhic law right now because uh, most of us uh, drove automobiles, which meant we lit, lit fires and under the uh, understanding of uh, Orthodox Judaism. Um, and I'm not sure that that's what the Sabbath was really all about either. Um, I, one of the things that I think you have to realize is that he is looking at this almost as an isolated point. And he's saying, look at the text itself. This is what it's telling us. And uh, he, he is not engaging in, well, what is that? How do we fit that in with uh, the passage in Mark that you referred to? Uh, he is just simply saying, this is, uh, if you read the story and you just try to understand it through the eyes of uh, somebody who's hearing it, uh, read uh, from, you know, Moses, uh, that this is the picture that you get. Now we have a comment here and there's one in the back that, and then we'll see if we can move on and try to. Yeah. <laughs> Another aspect might be that this is a Christ reaction to the very strict rules that the Jewish uh, rabbis had put in place uh, documenting what they can and what they cannot do on the Sabbath, and they made the Sabbath a day of, uh, of not delight, but a day of uh, sorrow and uh, frustration because they had so many rules and regulations. So it may have been, that statement may have been a philosophical reaction to their rules and regulations. In which case, it might not necessarily apply to the, uh, the Sabbath as it originally came out of the uh, Creator's hand. I believe we can reconcile these two things by remembering the fact that uh, both man and the Sabbath were created as a revelation about God in the context of the great controversy. Uh, that's true, and unfortunately, man did not fulfill his uh, role in that uh, controversy, at least the, the best role. And uh, to be fair, the Sabbath has not always fulfilled its best role either, which uh, uh, may explain Jesus' uh, criticism of how it was being interpreted in his day. Um, anyway, uh, getting back to uh, where, uh, where uh, Dr. Turner is uh, uh, talking, he says, all true theology aims to relate to the world in which it exists, in which it is always in dialogue. And so he's envisioning Moses writing this down and, uh, and actually, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, of uh, uh, theology that Moses would know about from uh, other cultures. Uh, any biblical interpreter, therefore, must first ask what a text meant in its original setting before reflecting on what it means in the present. So he's going to delve into what it meant. Uh, in the ancient world, the topic of creation was seen as being part of the larger issues and not an end of, in itself. So texts con uh, containing creation narratives tend to explore the meaning of life, the nature of the gods, human destiny, and so on. And the imagery they use in describing creation is an attempt to explain the significance or function of elements of the cosmos in relation to the gods, rather than to provide a description of physical or historical reality. They didn't really care whether their myths were true or not, or in some sense they were true, they had to be true because they corresponded to facts on the ground. Marduk must be the best god because, after all, his city was ruling over all the other cities. Um, these ancient myths are therefore primarily theological and maybe political and provide a fruitful source for comparative theological study with Genesis 1. There are inevitable similarities in some areas, 
but more tellingly, numerous significant contrasts. Um, uh, yeah, can we have the mic here? I was just wondering, are these, where are these conclusions coming from? Are they put together by you, or are you taking them out of the book? Um, or? Where it's written, I have tried to follow his, in fact, a good share of this is quotes. Oh, um, I see. Okay. Direct quotes. And uh, in some cases, th there's summaries. Um, but uh, in this particular case, like what I'm doing right now, in the beginning in heaven and earth are actually uh, quotes that he's, of course, taking from Genesis and, and using his key ideas. And he's going to contrast them. And what I will quote now is actually in his article. Um, the problem I have is I can't just read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would take way too long, number one. And so what you're getting is kind of a Reader's Digest condensation of what he had to say. Uh, in a, a, where I get off, I will, uh, that, sometimes that will be my commentary. And if you get confused as to which is which, feel free to ask. Um, in the beginning, in heavens and earth, are contrasted with Enuma Elish. In the beginning, God was there at the beginning of time. He created everything that existed. And then Enuma Elish, when the skies above were not yet named, nor earth below pronounced by name, when no gods were man yet no gods were manifest, nor names pronounced, nor destinies decreed, then gods were born within them. So you have the gods here actually somehow uh, being created, coming out of, I don't know, chaos or something. But you don't have a god who is there at the beginning. See, in the beginning, god created. Or uh, pick Egypt. Praise to you, Atom. Praise to you, Kephrer, which I'm gathering is actually a different name for the same God, who created himself. You became high in this your name, high ground. You created yourself in this your name, Kephrer. So this is a God that creates himself. There are gods that create themselves. In Genesis, the God was just there and doesn't even ask how the God came to be. It just was always there. There's a clear distinction between God the creator and the created cosmos. And this, again, contrasts um, with the uh, surrounding cosmologies. God speaks. He just says. It happens. Um, uh, he doesn't, doesn't sound like he speaks to an army of angels who then do it. He just, uh, when he decides it's going to happen, it happens. Um, to whom? It isn't said. And there is no trace of God's fighting and God overcoming some other God, and then, uh, which is, of course, uh, in Enuma Elish, for example, Marduk, uh, takes the lead again against Tiamat, and that's how our present Earth was created. Um, the functions of the lights of day four is emphasized, and they're not controlling human destiny. That is to say, they just simply are there to mark the time. And that takes away the fatalism that was oftentimes in the other ancient religion, you know. If the stars are aligned, you go okay. If the stars are not aligned, you're, you're hung. And there's nothing you can do about that. There's a, a theological declaration. God is the source of light. The heavenly bodies are not God's, but simply the means he chooses later to fulfill certain roles. And this is his explanation of the having light formed before the sun on day four. Uh, it's a very clearly theological point that's being made here. And that is basically God 
he doesn't need a sun to to create light. He just creates the light and it's there. Um, the stars are almost an afterthought. Uh, he made the stars also, or if you go back to the original Hebrew, it's just and the stars. And they don't get any any further billing than that. Well, et hakokavim. Um, the contrast with the pagan idea that the stars are actually, in some senses, more important than the sun and the moon. It also, by the way, as I can throw this in, contrasts with the modern idea that the sun is just a medium rate star, um, an average star, an average galaxy, uh, and the stars are, in terms of physical size, some of them much more important than the sun. Um, although, interestingly enough, if you went back to the ancients, they're more impressed with the planets, the wandering stars, than they are with the rest of them. Uh, again, the tenin, the sea monsters, are just created by God. There's no problem. There's no having to slay them. Uh, we might note in passing, and this is again a quote from the book, that the effortless nature of God's creation in Genesis 1 contrasts not only with the ancient myths of struggle, but also with modern views that limit themselves solely to the survival of the fittest as an explanation for life on Earth. So now he draws a modern uh, point out of it. Human beings are not simply animals. They are God's representatives on Earth, for they were created. Uh, and he quotes Genesis uh, 127 in the image of God. Uh, there is the plural, let us make man in our image. And his explanation of that is not that it's an, a fossil from previous uh, a polytheistic religion. It's not an address to the elements of earth, uh, that the God and the elements of earth will create man. And it's not the plural of fullness suggesting the Trinity, which um, uh, puts him in conflict with our author from last week, H. Ross Cole. Um, or at least <coughs> partial conflict. Um, he calls it a plural of deliberation. He says it's used again in Babel, where let us go down and confound their language. And the interesting thing is, he makes the point that at Babel, then God singular went down and confounded the language. Um, he might have pointed out that here in Genesis, that God, after saying, let us make man in our image, God created man in his image, singular. In the image of God created he him. So uh, he says this is actually for emphasis. And so although man does not take first place in his reading of Genesis, man does certainly take a second place. It underlines, as he puts it, the significance of humans. The original domination implied responsibility so that man was not given a carte blanche to do whatever he wanted to with the animals, that he was supposed to rule over them in a, uh, if I can put it that way, humane manner. Uh, and this, uh, he, and now he deals with a text that we've run into before being used for uh, arguing that there's some confusion in Genesis. Um, Thus the heavens and the earth and all their hosts were completed. Um, and on the seventh day, God completed his work. It's the same word, completed here and completed there. Although in one case, it's passive form. In another case, it's an active form. But he says there's really no confusion here because, you see, the close reading, as he put it, shows that the problem is only imagined. God had completed the creation of the physical universe. God's work is not finished until he blesses and sanctifies the seventh day. And as he notes, not even humans are actually sanctified, um, according to the record. And then he goes on to summarize this part of it again uh, fairly succinctly. Rather than being merely of interest to antiquarians, ancient Near Eastern mythologies provide helpful points of contact with Genesis. 
and highlight how the biblical text was in dialogue with the thought of its own time and articulated its theology in that cultural context. From this comparative study, the theological emphases and distinctive contributions of Genesis are more easily seen. Its picture of God is a personal, eternal God who stands apart from the cosmos he creates and effortlessly brings order out of chaos. Since there are no other gods in the account, the heavenly bodies are relegated to lights in the sky, not having any astrological significance and thus emphasizing God's dominion over his creation. At the same time, this view spares humans the fatalism inherent in ancient views about the powers of the sun, moon, and stars. In addition, humans are accorded a high status, underlined by their creation being introduced by a plural of deliberation, being made in the image of God, and acquiring dominion over God's work in which they receive both rights and responsibilities. Yet despite their significance, it is the Sabbath that is the capstone of creation. Holy time, standing outside the confines of human space and beyond the capacity of human physical senses to comprehend, defines creation as ultimately a divine and holy en enterprise. And then he goes into something that uh, Warren uh, here is very familiar with, sanctuary symbolism. And uh, it's not a complete exposition, but it does give one a taste of, of what sanctuary symbolism exists in, uh, in Genesis. Uh, God names the various parts of creation implying his uh, uh, power over them. And then he outlines a chapter and he says, here are, and the parenthesis is my summary of what he has to say because it otherwise doesn't fit. Uh, but uh, time, he starts out in the beginning. And then, first day, you have time. That's the first part, the first column. And then the fourth day, you have time. And then finally, at the end, you have holy time. So time becomes an important part of the creation. I, he says, uh, lights, th this is the same word as the sanctuary lights. Uh, and so there's a parallel between the sanctuary and creation. Um, he says there are a lot of generally accepted parallels, and one of them is, interestingly enough, in the building of the sanctuary, there are six times that the Lord spoke or said to Moses, whatever, and the seventh time is the Lord said to Moses, you sh yourselves as I speak to the Israelites, you shall keep my Sabbaths. The seventh time happens to be on the Sabbath. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Um, there are finished passages, for example. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, right? You find this same uh, word finished, uh, yakal. In this way, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. The Israelites had done everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then you have another fascinating finished, which has to do again with the sanctuary. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, this is in Joshua, so they finished dividing the land. And so there is this parallel between the story of Genesis 1 and the sanctuary story. Um, the garden of Eden was in the east and it was facing the east. It is the same orientation as the temple or as the uh, tabernacle before it. Um, the uh, job of Adam was to work and to take care of the garden. It's Evid and uh, Shamar, commonly translated watch. But it's the same word that's used for the priests who are to work and to take care of the sanctuary. Um, the four rivers of Eden, of Eden, one of them's name was the Gihon. Now there isn't a Gihon River in the Bible other one than this, but there is, interestingly, a Gihon Spring, and it was in Jerusalem. 
and uh, Ezekiel's vision, you may remember, has a river coming out of the sanctuary and spreading out and uh, getting so deep that you couldn't uh, go through the river. Um, and uh, there are cherubim at the gate of Eden and also all throughout the sanctuary. And the only other place where cherubim show up is in Ezekiel 28 in a fascinating passage where the king of Tyre is told in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering. And then it lists a whole bunch of stones, which incidentally are similar to, if not exactly identical. I haven't actually looked at it to see whether they're all 12, but they're very similar to the 12 stones that are in the breastplate of the high priest. And they were worked in gold. And then it goes on to say, with an anointed cherub as guardian, I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God. And of course, the holy mountain can be a, um, a, a way of referring to Mount Zion. Uh, let's see, we have a question over here, comment. Well, I, I was just curious about using the word guardian. Since sin hadn't arisen, what were they guarding from? Was this more ceremonial? The the, the you mean yeah. the garden uh, that yeah, that, uh, that uh, the king of Tyre was, that, which is commonly like assumed to be uh, a a um, a type for Lucifer. Well, I think yeah, this and yeah. uh, Isaiah but are the two passages that, that are commonly felt. But to what be I'm saying is just uh, beyond the word guardian uh, with an anointed cherub as guardian. Um, what, what were that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I have an easy answer, one that's going to make, uh, uh, that's going to s suddenly make everything gel. Uh, maybe we can leave that for another time, because I, I can't really can't really answer you why it would be as guardian. I placed you for one thing. First thing I would want to do is go back to the Hebrew and find out whether. Guardian is a proper translation because sometimes uh, uh, we uh, sometimes we work off of English when we should be working off of Hebrew. Um, but uh, I, uh, you know, it, it would take more investigation than I am able to do immediately. The seven-branched candlestick is often felt to be a stylized cosmic tree of life. And uh, the lights in the candlestick is uh, sometimes felt to be parallel to the fourth day of creation as well. Um, the Garden of Eden is an archetypal sanctuary. Uh, in Isaiah 66, uh, 1, you'll notice that uh, Isaiah seems to be drawing us back to the original sanctuary rather than the one on earth. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is my resting place? And uh, you know, for Adventists, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, but maybe uh, we have missed something uh, in that perhaps the earth itself should be viewed as a temple. And that says something uh, about uh, our views on conservation, I think, as well. Um, the fact that the biblical text weaves sanctuary symbolism into its account of creation also constitutes a significant counter to the frequent exhortations from certain quarters that the only legitimate approach to Genesis 1 is to read it, quote, literally, end quote. This position assumes the text to be one-dimensional, Rather, it is a complex and subtle narrative that works at more than one level, rewarding both literal and theological and symbolic readings. We impoverish our understanding by imposing on it doctrinaire hermeneutical restrictions that fail to do justice to its essential nature. So he's arguing that uh, there's more to Genesis 1 than meets the eye. God is the God of the chosen people in Genesis 12 and so forth. Um, he is also the God of all people, Genesis 2 through 11, and in Genesis 1, the emphasis, he's the God of all creation itself. Um, 
he says that it's inadequate to limit one's interest to scientific and historical reconstruction. Uh, not that I, I don't think he'd be critical of doing that. He just wants to say that we need to lift our eyes beyond that. Adventist wor works scarcely mention the sec uh, sanctuary, although uh, uh, Warren is trying to correct that. <laughs> uh, we see the Sabbath because it lies on the surface. But he says, to see sanctuary theology here requires a greater degree of literary engagement, a willingness to accept that these chapters might be more than simple historical accounts of actual events, and an openness to new ways of utilizing scripture. When read in its original context, Genesis 1, the quote, is a tract for the times, challenging ancient assumptions about the nature of God, the world, and mankind. That's him quoting somebody else. This is all him. It would be a pity if we failed to allow it to speak theologically to the fundamental questions of human existence in our own time and to challenge our assumptions. It was radical then. It is radical now. Now, he finishes. That's the final thing he says. Now, I mostly agree with Dr. Turner. Uh, the defense of the scriptural story of Genesis fits uh, that mode. There is such a thing as propositional revelation. That was chapter 1. The text is reliable. Chapter 2, the word speaks for itself. Chapter 3, Genesis is theologically sound, both the last chapter that we looked at and this chapter. Um, Genesis is ancient, which is what we're going to come to next time, the tablet theory. Um, Genesis describes a recent creation. Uh, creation and biblical theology are mutually supportive. The New Testament supports the Genesis creation. Creation is more compatible with Jesus and evolution. And then, of course, five chapters dealing with the uh, scientific arguments and one with ethics and theistic evolution. Uh, one apiece with ethics and theistic evolution. That's the overall plan, and that's where his chapter fits into the plan. There is one place where I take issue with the way the chapter is expressed. Now before I do that I should um, uh, mention our areas of agreement. Uh, we agree on the theological significance of Genesis 1. I think that uh, where he's drawing stuff is perfectly le legitimate enterprise and in fact one that should be done. The fact that this chapter is in the book leads me to believe uh, that we, do, uh, we agree that there is a literal as well as a theological meaning. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, he wouldn't say there isn't a literal meaning, he would just simply say that it, there's more in it than that. Um, I agree that there's a strong relationship between the creation and the Garden of Eden and the sanctuary. I agree that we have not often enough explored the theological meaning of Genesis 1. But my concern is that Dr. Turner does not adequately appreciate the problems that caused the neglect of theology, that caused what he views as this narrowing of interest, nor does he appreciate adequately the source of the theological power of Genesis. And I think the two concerns are, in fact, related to each other. The Joseph story is a powerful one. Uh, that can be read on several levels. The simple story that you tell the kids that they can understand. You can read it as a theological essay. You can read it as a redemptive story. You can read it as a family dynamic study. A uh, guy with two wives and, and, and their struggles and you can just see how it, how it fits. Um, I don't think that Moses set out to write a multifaceted story with all these properties. What he did instead was simply told the truth, and the fact of the matter is, because the truth, because all of these ways of looking at the truth are in fact valid ways, that the truth itself contains those facets. And so you don't have to carefully craft, all you have to do is just tell uh, things the way they are and be enough of a literary person to make sense. Um, uh, similarly, I don't think Moses set out, set out to write a brilliant theological treatise on creation. He simply wrote the truth as he knew it, probably the truth that was passed down to him, as we will see later 
It was God that probably gave the original story. And God probably did it precisely because he knew that certain things would come up and he wanted to have the truth out there before error got started. The very similitude in various areas, in both in later Genesis and in Genesis 1, is in fact caused by the veracity of the story. And that means that if you attack the veracity of the story, it vitiates all those theological conclusions. It means that, oh, you're drawing something out, but you know, it doesn't really mean too much. I mean, we don't do theology based on Santa Claus. Is there somebody really out there with a red suit checking everybody's, uh, uh, whether they're on the list or not, and double checking? I mean, it's what the song says, but, you know, this is, even if you think that that is the way the story came down, which most of us know that, that, that the story has grown with time, um, you don't trust it for anything. And so if this stuff isn't really true, then all those wonderful conclusions you've drawn from it don't have any weight. I think that it is good sometimes to do what he's doing here and ignore the critics and see the story for what it is, including its rich theological meaning. But I think we have to be careful not to denigrate the efforts of the apologists who are, in fact, protecting the foundation on which one, uh, I was going to say, builds the marvelous theological message that can be found in Genesis, but you don't really build it. You simply recognize that it's there. As, as an example of this, uh, you'll notice that part of what he says is the wonderful theological message that, you know, God creates light and then he creates the sun. And he's saying uh, to uh, uh, paraphrase a famous movie uh, uh, line, God don't need no stinking sun. But if it isn't true, then God really does need a stinking son. And the whole point is wrong. Finally, I think that Dr. Turner may have it backwards in a particular uh, area. If the Genesis account truly came from God's hand, then it would be more proper to say that the sanctuary has creation imagery than it would be to say that the creation has sanctuary imagery in it. You took my point from me. <laughs> it may even be that the ancient cosmologies are protests against the true story of creation rather than the other way around. Um, I, I think that God does have some foreknowledge and he laid out the story of creation, among other reasons, to counter what he knew would be natural human tendencies. But, you know, people wanted to believe that the gods were plural and fractious and maybe you could play one against the other. And uh, uh, they had to work to create just like we do. And that people had to slave away to feed the gods. So that was very convenient for the temple people because they could have everybody else slave away to feed them. Who were mostly not interested in the welfare of humans certainly not positively interested. Um, and so they chose to go a different route. And that's why the general, the polemic in Genesis is almost always said to be subliminal. It's not there on the surface because it wasn't originally a polemic. In fact, it is simply stating the truth and the falsehoods that come to fight against it realize that there's some pretty strong arguments in there against them. Um, it was intended to be a preemptive strike rather than a specific refutation, and that's why the polemic is implicit rather than explicit. And uh, in that regard, I might raise the question as to whether that polemic was also 
a preemptive strike against the grand theory of evolution. You know, the, the story that starts out with uh, vague origins, perhaps a Big Bang. Um, not that I disagree with the Big Bang itself, necessarily. Uh, but that goes on to have life originated spontaneously, that goes on to have life developing spontaneously by uh, one accidents and two, the survival of the fittest, which is an ugly theory if you look at it that way. Uh, and it certainly doesn't tend towards, uh, towards uh, preaching a gospel of love. And then continues on till today, and then uh, um, has its own implications for how we should behave today, and has its implications for the basis of morality. Morality is just what most people agree with and can change any time that most people decide to make a change. Um, and that the creation story is, in fact, a preemptive strike against that, as well as all of the ancient cosmologies that we've looked at. With that, I'm going to open the floor for uh, uh, comments and questions. Um, we have one over here, and then uh, one here and one here, let's, and one there. So let's let's start here. I'm not. I'm not asking this to make a statement or anything, but when you look at Genesis, how much real scientific information can we get out of it? And looking at Genesis, as we just did here, through the symbolic route, we can go on and on and on and on about the theology, theological aspect. But when it comes to the scientific, where you need some information. There really isn't very much. So how do we deal with that? Well, okay, there, there are a couple of things. One of them is that uh, Genesis should be viewed not just as scientific, but as historical. Yeah, but still, uh, we've got scientific um, questions that are out there that's, that's telling people that this whole thing is wrong. Well, those are, those are questions that are at least partly based on the idea that history is scientific. And I think one of the points that is being made here is that history is in fact not scientific at this point. That in the origin, you have in fact things that we cannot duplicate in the laboratory and in all probability, we'll never be able to. We are not able to speak and suddenly plants grow up. We're just not able to do that. Uh, if God decides to do it again, then we can watch it and then I guess it's reproducible and so therefore it kind of quasi enters the arena of science. It, it depends partly on how you define science and that's one of the, one of the problems that you have with science is is science explaining everything by, by virtue of natural law? In which case, Genesis is anti-scientific. On the other hand, is science uh, an attempt to understand what actually happened? Um, in which case, Genesis is as scientific as the rest. Because it's, what it's trying to do is describe uh, what happened in a uh, in a way that uh, deals with phenomena. Um, so the the to play devil's advocate. I mean, part of the thing is is that the argument I get a lot when I when I talk about Genesis as being at least somewhat scientific, historically based as a historical science, which is valid history has to have some scientific element to it, or you could not distinguish it from a fable or a made-up story. And so, but the retort I get a lot is that, hey, God can do anything, and so we have to believe the Bible just on faith regardless of what science says, because God can counter everything that's scientific. 
God can make virgin births. God can make the fossil record look old. God can change radiometric dating to make it look old. God can do all these things in order to test our faith, right? And so then you say, okay, well, what's the difference between the Bible story and a fable? And uh, you really, in my mind, cannot tell the difference if the Bible statements about at least some elements of physical reality cannot be tested in a falsifiable manner. If you really can't do that at all, then what you have is a fancy fable that has Santa Claus implications uh, to me. And uh, the, to me, the Bible has to be beyond that. It has to be testable in a, where you can potentially be wrong. You have to step out on a limb and see if you get cut off or not. And if you can't do that, what's the point? Um, and I'm going to agree with that point. And I'm going to say that that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit uncomfortable with what is going on with this particular uh, you know, his, his approach of saying, well, you, you know, uh, there's the theological on top of the literal and the people who just do literal are really misunderstanding the, the text and they, uh, well, okay, I, he gives hints that both is okay. See, I'm comfortable with that, uh, but I'm, I've, I'm very careful not to say that the people who understand it literally and don't move much beyond that are just, um, because I think if you don't at least take care of that, that level, the whole thing falls apart. Um, Warren, and then there, and then there, yes. I think you expected me to make a comment on temple theology. <laughs> I'm delighted to see this, finally see the light of day in scholarly studies within Adventism. 22 years ago, summer of, two, of 1990, I came to my dissertation committee at Andrews and proposed to do something on temple theology. There was enough in the literature to offer clues that that would be a fruitful area. My committee, being very conservative, said, well, we don't know how it's going to relate to Adventism. We don't know what direction you're going with it. We have all these questions. We're not sure, we're not sure, and we're not sure. So they directed me to do something else. And so finally, 22 years later, we can start seeing the light of day in scholarly studies. Now. We have seminaries on both sides of the Atlantic. Lawrence Turner is a professor at a seminary. Uh, we don't usually call it a theological seminary, but Newbold College offers a seminary degree. He's been chair of theology there. I've been a colleague of his. I taught there for two years and knew him very well. You're right, he would uphold the literal historical approach. He's not denigrating that, but he says both and. We need a deeper theological approach as well as the historical. We need, and they're stronger. They're I, a lot I, stronger. I would make the point that, uh, that I think it's good that sometimes we step away from the critics and constantly trying to build our foundation and exactly. say, well, what if the foundation is solid? Then where do we go from there? And I think that that his work in this case is, is very good. Uh, you've rightly detected that he's not a, an apologist. He's not answering the JEDP theory. He's not getting involved in all those things. He's just trying to say, what does the Bible say to us in 21st century? And I think done a marvelous job. And so maybe that's where we need to go. We need, we will, we will be stronger if we don't throw away the historical, as is happening in many venues, especially in North America. But if we look for deeper meaning, deeper roots for the theological. And those roots don't have to go to ancient Near Eastern literature. Um, there's a name, John Walton, who is an evangelical. He's looking at the ancient Near Eastern roots perhaps to the neglect of seeing the strong biblical roots that were already there. So maybe he's gone too far. So that's my little speech today. <laughs> okay. It's interesting uh, studying back uh, some of the other ancient religions, 
how there was a predominance of a number of the ancient uh, making uh, almost uh, like observatories looking at the uh, Orion stars, the Sirius stars. You see it uh, in the Druids, you see it in the uh, Egyptian cosmology, and there's even uh, suspicions that uh, parts of the, uh, the uh, layout of the, uh, those uh, great, uh, great pyramids of Egypt and also the Stonehenge uh, in England, and there's also the Stonehenge and a number of these strange, strange uh, pillars in uh, the Normandy Peninsula that uh, appear to be uh, pointing toward certain types of astrological events. So there was a tremendous amount of astrological event going on in the uh, ancient, ancient times there. I would agree with that. Um, I By the way, uh, it is uh, five past 11. I'm, I'm going to disappear in, in myself in about five minutes. So. Um, uh, today I have some, uh, an appointment I need to keep, but, uh, short uh, comment. <laughs> so. I, I like your idea very much about the, um, that Moses wrote it as he understood it from being passed down and, and maybe the Lord also, well, I'm sure the Holy Spirit guided him in writing it and not as some, in some polemical context. And I, I don't know, for some reason, the thought came to my mind of the t um, quote I read from Ellen White. It's, in, it's not in Patri Patriarchs and Prophets, but it's in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, where she said God required his people to number by sevens so that they would not forget the importance of the Sabbath and his creative work. I that have you read that before and I think that because I was thinking to myself you know I don't think these numbers are are just made up or accidental they're there for and and that really solidified my thinking that God directed in these numbers they're not just fancy it's, it's not just fancy stuff it has deep rooted meaning and I so to me that goes along with your idea of you know, God, God anticipated all these things coming up, and He, He wanted people to remember the truth. Yes, Ariel. Yeah, I'm, I'm referring back to uh, our earlier discussion that uh, you know, we can God can do anything, and of course, the argument is well, uh, since God can do anything. You have, uh, you are no longer a scientist. You can't. There's no way to test anything, and so on. Uh, one little sidelight to that is, basically, the general theory of evolution does exactly the same thing. They have an ID for everything, no matter what you come up with. They got an answer. Uh, evolution can do anything. Yes, yes, and if you want an explanation for altruism, evolution explains that. If you want an explanation for selfishness, evolution it's, it's explains it's that. So and, um, and, and to predict whether one species will be monogamous, for example, or will be uh, pr uh, promiscuous, they have no way of explaining uh, uh, ahead of the fact, but after the fact, they can explain everything. Yeah, but. Uh, getting back to the more basic, that's no excuse for, for thinking that everything is irrational. Uh, just if God did everything capriciously, if we can use that term, uh, reality would not make sense to us. Now, we have to face the fact that there is cause and effect uh, in the world. Uh, there's just Things happen, we can reason, we can think things out, and so on. Uh, the universe seems basically rational, and uh, true God can do anything, but if he had made everything capriciously, we'd not be able to reason, we'd not be able to think. Uh, yes. uh, the fact that we can reason, I think, said, hey, this is not the kind of God we're dealing with. We're dealing with God that uh, has a system uh, where you can have freedom of choice, behave independently, there's cause and effect, and reality makes sense. Yes, Sean. One last thing, and I think we have to run. 
I really appreciate you pointing out that uh, the sanctuary is probably a reflection of creation and, and of the original Garden of Eden and the original sanctuary of heaven itself and not the other way around. I mean, when you were talking about comments from this book, I was, I kind of had flashbacks to uh, A Beautiful Mind, you know, the movie where you see patterns in everything, you know, this and that. I mean, if you ask everybody in here to list their top seven uh, precious stones, I'm sure we'd all come up with very similar lists, right? I mean, you, you can make patterns out of pretty much everything and see elephants and clouds and whatever. And when we start doing that and make symbolism, uh, you know, force symbolism onto places where there may not be symbolism uh, intended by the author. I mean, I was in Sabbath school discussions, or not necessarily uh, Bible study discussions when I was in medical school here with a bunch of friends of mine. And this, became, this idea became popular. Everything had an underlying symbolic meaning. You know, why the the precious vessels from Solomon's temple, what did that mean? What was the hidden meaning under, uh, underlying that? And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we try to force theology onto something that may have not have intended to have it. And then later on, sure, there's parallels and reflections later on, but those may, may have been attached later on and not necessarily intended by the original author of Genesis. So I think that's a key point here, and I, I don't think this author quite grasped that point. Well, to, to be fair, if God was the original author, then he may have anticipated some uh, trends that would be trendy later on that, uh, and, and right. specifically... Right, but to attach symbolic meaning to it. Uh, I, I think we have to be careful. We do. Well, I think that we'll stop at that point, but um, uh, next week we'll uh, go into the documentary hypothesis and the real documentary hypothesis and uh, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs>